Hi guys, how's it going? It's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, and I need to put this up right away, because look, it's second attempt time for Rocket Lab launching Don't Stop Me Now uh, from New Zealand. This is an awesome launch because I love Rocket Lab, I love their electron rocket, and yeah, if you can't tell by looking at the thing here, we have 28 minutes from watching an orbital class little mini baby rocket go to space. So let's do what we do at the beginning of all of these, which is I'm going to show you guys what's going to be happening on this exact mission. So, all right, let's start off by going like this. Ready? We go to a little website called everydayastronaut.com. I know. And of course, I forgot to do this again. Hold on. <laughs> There you go. So if you go to everydayastronaut.com, you click on pre-launch previews, any rocket launch that's coming up, if you're like, hey, hey, maybe I should, that's kind of a dumb place for my face, huh? Oh, no. <laughs> Watch Tim learn how to use OBS for the first time out of a thousand times. Okay, if you need to, if you need to like, you know, if you have an upcoming rocket launch, and you're like, what is going on? Are they going to land this? Are they testing it? Uh, what's the payload? Where's this thing going? When's it taking off? Which launch pads it take? All of the things that you guys ask me on Twitter, I already have the answers to. Just go to pre-launch previews, everydayastronaut.com, click on pre-launch previews, click on the mission you're, you have questions about, and look at this. We have the answers. We have the answers, everybody. It's it's all here. It's all here, guys. So, okay. So, liftoff time is, again, scheduled for 4.43 to 6.32. So, there's just over under two hours um, of a window here for today's launch. So, they have, you know, two hours to, to nail this launch. The other day, they, they used up all two hours trying to get the rocket off the ground. But it, unfortunately, was not able to because the winds never died down to be acceptable limits. And again, yeah, for the time, uh, just look up at the top right hand of your screen. You will see the countdown clock there is about 26 minutes from now, 26 and a half minutes. The mission name is Don't Stop Me Now, which you might be familiar with that name. Uh, if you maybe have heard that before, it is a Queen song. But the reason it's really cool... Um, is I'll just read this straight off the website here that we have. Uh, the mission bears the name of a hit from the iconic rock band Queen. The colorful name co commemorates former Rocket Lab board member Stanford Scott Smith, who recently passed away. Smith, whose initials can be found on the mission patch, was an avid fan of Queen, which I just think that that's just super cool. So, so this mission is kind of dedicated to him, uh, and and us, I assume his family and friends too. You know, just a, a nice. Nice little nod there. So that it's named after, yeah, after that Queen song. So uh, it's a ride share between three uh, undis undis undisclosed payloads for the National Reconnaissance Office, which is NRO, NASA's Ilana program, uh, and then an RAAF slot, which is the uh, Royal Air Force, uh, Royal Australian Air Force. So the launch provider, the of course, the company launching this payload to space, these different satellites, the company doing that is Rocket Lab. The customers paying for this launch is the United the United States' National Reconnaissance Office's Office or the NRO, NASA under the Alana program, which is like a small sat launching uh kind of little little thing going on there and the royal australian air force like we mentioned the rocket there's only one rocket that rocket lab makes and launches and that's called the electron rocket and uh so anytime for now at least for the foreseeable future anytime you see anything about rocket lab just assume it's going to be an electron rocket the launch location now this one could change because there are now th there's two and a half pads for Rocket Lab. They have um, Pad A at Launch Complex 1 in Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. That's where this particular launch is taking off from. They also have now Launch Complex 2, which is in, uh, which is in Wallops, Virginia. 
So it's over there in the eastern, the east coast of the United States, which is awesome. So that's their second pad or their second complex. But now they also have pad, they're working on pad B out at launch complex one. So they literally will end up with three launch pads here, but hopefully I think around the end of the year or pretty relatively soon, um, or for sure within a year from now, they will have um, three operational pads already. So they're just going to be cranking out rockets uh, and launches like you would not believe. Now the payload mass, we don't really know. The NRO payloads, uh, the three different little satellites there are of unknown weights, but the, the Electron can carry up to 225 kilograms or so to low Earth orbit, which is about 500 pounds. So you can tell because you know, the, the rocket's capable of that much. These other two, like M2 Pathfinder is only four kilograms. It's a CubeSat and, and uh, Andesite is only three kilograms. So uh, yeah, or it's eight different small sats or CubeSats that are really light. So altogether three kilograms. So there's clearly those other NRO payloads have to be more than that. Otherwise it's hardly not worth launching an entire rocket for. So um, I'm assuming that's they're a little bit larger because again the vehicle is capable of 225 kilograms. But now here's the thing: we don't really know where this is going because of the National Reconnaissance National Reconnaissance Office uh, the contracts and the fact that it's top secret. We don't necessarily know the exact destination, so um, we don't really know. So that it could be still a light payload and be going a little bit further away than than most of them. So will they be attempting to recover the first stage? Now that now this might sound like a funny question because you th might think of first stage recovery and you might think of you know SpaceX, but don't forget Rocket Lab is working on ramping up their capabilities to be able to return their first stage boosters as well, which is of course extremely exciting. Now they're doing something super crazy. We'll talk about that here in a second, but the uh, they are not recover. They aren't even attempting to do reentry on this mission because they've already done that a couple times, three times now or so, and they they know how to reenter. They've figured out reentering no big deal and uh from here on out until flight 17 will be the first big block upgrade now this is flight 12 so we have five more flights before we get to um their attempt to really actually go for it and i'll talk more about how they are going to try to recover their first stage boosters um yeah it, it's really cool so where will the first stage land this booster will end up splashing down destructively somewhere downrange kind of wherever it wherever it goes uh, we could probably find out if we needed to know how far downrange i bet we could go to flightclub.io declan murphy has this awesome website that <laughs> goes like through all the different trajectories of basically every different rocket and everything so super cool um this is uh and will they be attempting to recover the fairings fairing reuse is not a capability of electron and i'm gonna say i'm not gonna say for now as in like for now but it, it does seem like something that would be you know in their wheelhouse they they would probably be capable of doing that if they wanted to pursue that at some point, if they found it to be a business case to be able to do so. Um, you know, obviously SpaceX seems to have had decent success with it, and maybe Rocket Lab could could also utilize that someday. But there's been no talks of that. I'm just saying, like off the top of my head, that you know they they could maybe consider doing that someday if they found it to be cost beneficial. Um, and worth the research and development. So this will be the 12th flight of the Electron rocket, the second flight for Rocket Lab this year. They should have had like way more than that, but of course the pandemic literally, sh New Zealand full blown shut down. And then they've now had three weeks of zero cases. So now they New, New Zealand is completely back open, which I'm extremely jealous about. <laughs> um, I'm really proud of them for just totally locking the doors and just everyone hunkering down. And apparently everyone did a good enough job that they don't have any cases anymore. So they're back in business. And I think they'll just be very, very busy now. And this is the second flight of the Electron Block 2, um, which... The, I don't know if that's entirely true. Do we know if that's true, Discord? I don't know if that's true. Because I don't think they're even technically two. Um, I don't know if that's if they're even quite to the Electron Block 2 yet. I think the block upgrade isn't really until that Flight 17. So, yeah. Anyway. Okay, so uh, where to launch? Yeah, you're watching it here. You, you got it. You guys are good to go. Uh, now, this is, of course, a graphic uh, made by Jeff Barrett. And you can see here that the height and the dimensions of this vehicle, this is a very small rocket. I've pushed one of these boosters around with my bare hands, like literally just moved it around because it's, it's not very tall. You know, it's not it's sitting on its side. It's only four feet tall, 1.2 meters tall. Um, height is 17 meters. It's not that much taller than you can see in my, my case here. There's 
the landing legs of like uh, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, it's not that much taller than that. So it's a pretty small little rocket. As a matter of fact, I think fully laden, I'm pretty sure Falcon 9 could could probably stack one of those and launch it into orbit inside of one of their fairings. So it's it's quite a small little cool miniature rocket basically. And it, it's, yeah, big fan. Um, now, of course, one of the, well, we'll talk more about some of this stuff, but when we talked about the recoverability, I have a video all about, you know, why, how they're planning to recover. And they're, they're going to be doing something very different for the recoverability. They're working on air recovery, which um, snatching out of the air with a helicopter. And that might sound absurd, but don't forget the, this has been done from, you know, for decades now, since the early 60s, late 50s, we were recovering satellites and spy film from like Corona satellites using air recovery. So this is something that's, that's been done before. Um, and, and because the rocket booster is so much smaller, it can be easily manageable by a, a large helicopter. Uh, obviously, SpaceX's Falcon 9 is so big that it would <laughs> it would require like an unbelievably big rocket to be able to to snatch something like that out of the air. Um, even their Falcon 1 was a lot bigger than the Electron. So this is a very small rocket, very lightweight. It only weighs around a metric ton dry. Um, so yeah, it's just not even not even a, a big deal. So <laughs> oh jeez, Discord. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, no, Corona satellites had nothing to do with the virus, <laughs> but yeah, if you guys, if you guys want to know, you know, why, why can rocket lab, why do they think they're going to be able to catch a rocket out of the air? Um, why didn't SpaceX try this? Why doesn't SpaceX do something like this with their fairings instead of the boat? Why don't they use helicopters? Um, and comparing even things like the smart reuse from Yola, please watch this video. I promise it's really good. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed making this video because I, I learned a lot making it. That, that's my, that's my metric for how much I like a video. Did I learn a lot while making it? And, uh, and I, that's always my intention is that I want to learn because if I'm learning something, odds are that my audience will learn along with me, you know, and I, I like it because in our discord channel, we end up, I feel like, you know, we'll end up sitting there and learning stuff together and, and having discussions about things and we'll all be like, oh, that's cool. That'd be cool to try, you know? Yeah. So there's, there's your story. There is, if you know, if you need to look up this stuff, but please everyone say real quick, thank you to Alex Crouch and the rest of my, my awesome website crew who's been making these uh, articles way better than I ever could and staying on top of them and doing stuff that I just would not have time to do. So everyone thank my website crew, give them a quick little round of applause in, in the chat because they are awesome. So yeah, all the, all the authors, all the editors, they are incredible. So um, yeah, let's get to some of your questions before I'm going to try and pull up there. It looks like we still have about two and a half minutes here. So let me try and answer a couple of your guys' questions. Um, first off, oh, look at this. Look at this. We have a chat from David Willis. Hey, David, how are you? Um, <laughs> $10 from David saying gamer moment. Thank you so much, guys. Um, hacky, <laughs> hacky. We also have um, happy hacking video blog. Um, I've in 2019, I've been to Japan and saw a three meter high replica of the H2B rocket on top of the Tokyo Tower. It was also a surprise when my bus passed in front of JAXA. Please consider making a video about Japanese rockets. That is, de there's so many rockets that I want to talk about. You know, all of the Japanese rockets, pretty much anything out of China and India, I really want to talk about. ESA, I haven't ever mentioned, really hardly talked about the Ariane vehicles at all. I have a lot to do. So, um, yeah, I'm going to try and go through your guys' questions here really quick. Um, this is a great question, though, from Nicole. Uh, Nicole Allen says, will there be a Starlink stream in five hours? Well, Nicole, let me send you that link in chat here. Or not in chat, but just in the... Um, let's see here. Check this out. Doot, 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 doot. Yeah, I definitely will be streaming. In other words, I'm not sleeping tonight. I'll probably take like a power nap. But yeah, if you guys want to join me, Starlink, SpaceX will be launching 58, not 60, 58 Starlink satellites in four hours. <laughs> I'm not going to sleep and it's going to be terrible. Um, yeah, boo. So um, yeah, I, I will be there for you guys. And if you guys, oh, uh, I see PJ Finster wants to know, 
where is the Discord info? Discord is a Patreon exclusive thing. We have just the absolute best community and we keep it that way so that, you know, we don't have people coming in and being trolls and stuff like that. So if you guys want to join our awesome Discord channel um, or gain access to our exclusive subreddit or exclusive live streams, uh, go to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. That helps me continue to do everything I do and make everything better for you guys and, and just up the game constantly. Just keep pushing. I'm working. I'm building a new studio starting next week. I'm just unbelievably excited. So there's a lot of cool things going on. If you guys want to help me do what I do, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. Okay. So, um, Oh, here's another question. Will I be covering Starlink eight tonight? Again? Yes. We have a new, we have some new members, by the way, we have, um, we have Texas Patriot. We also had, um, Syri- uh, Syrian McCabe, Brian Barnavel, Geet and Geet, uh, Pro Hit and Nicholas Bomber. Thank you guys so much for your your awesome memberships. You guys, that is that I promise all that stuff gets put to good use. Okay, so um <laughs> Ooh, look at Luke. Luke knows what's up. I will definitely be getting myself a sidecar coffee cappuccino tomorrow in the morning. Thanks, Luke. How are you, man? Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> um Let's see here. This is a good question um, from Iceman Sam forty four. Um, the 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 term we tend to use is crude instead of manned because, uh, spoiler alert, um, not just men go to space these days. <laughs> so um, it is normal to say crude or uh, human mission, human space flight. Um, so yeah, the. Uh, the only people right now launching humans to space currently, at least orbital, um, would be SpaceX, which we just saw for the first time with DM2. It was the first time they flew anyone. Other than that, Soyuz is going to be the, the tried and tested, you know, wonderful rocket that's safely taken humans to space for ever, basically, uh, and, and into orbit. And then, of course, China has their uh, Shenzhou program. And it's, it's kind of like a derivative and, and, in a sense, comes from the Soyuz heritage. Uh, but those are it. Other than that, like, uh, besides, I guess, Virgin Galactic will soon be hopefully sending more people into suborbital space, just doing quick little 20-minute tourism hops. And same with Blue Origin's uh, new Shepard program. But outside of that, if you see a rocket launch launching, there's no one on it. Like, that's just, it's very, very unusual. So, um, let's see here. This is a good question from Shona Guy here. Let me see if I can pull up flightclub.io. Why is my... Hmm, my internet might have borked a little bit. Let's see, is Rocket Lab, we're still waiting on Rocket Lab's live stream, so they might, there, there might have been a little bit of a push. Um, let's see. Um, Sven, we can talk about that here in a little bit from Discord, uh, but let me go to flightclub.io, because Declan Murphy, I, I mentioned him earlier already, but he has just such an awesome website, and what I can do is do this, make you guys see what we're doing here. Um, we can look up, running out of fingers, here's an electron launch. You can look up like launches, see, run a simulation here. And you will see uh, every all the telemetry of the missions, including 3D visualizations. So you'll actually see where this rocket will be launching. Now notice, it starts off in the United States, which is kind of funny, because these rockets launch from New Zealand. Look at that. And this one was obviously going into polar orbit, because it launched basically straight south. Um, so yeah, there that's the launch trajectory. So you could definitely catch it. Um, some of these launches, I don't know, I, we don't know where this one's really going. It might be going east. Uh, but this particular launch, this was an older launch, so... Um, I, I can't really tell you, but you could probably see it along the east coast of, of New Zealand. Of course, if you live in, um, you know, if you live out there in Antarctica, you could probably see it. And you might see, I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to tell. But there's flightclub.io for you guys if you ever have any questions about when, where, how, what, when, why, how, and where, and why, and how. Um, let's see here. And from Texas Patriot again, uh, pair character. I love that it it just says the sticker on here. That's my favorite thing. Pair character dancing under a rain of confetti and talking his taking his hat off and saying, "You are amazing." Well, thank you so much for the the pair thing, 
uh, informing people that, that the pair thinks I'm amazing. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, from John, uh, John, Jonathan, um, why doesn't Methalox engines have some, the same clogging issues as tr tr the traditional RP1 fuel? You need to watch my video on rocket pollution because we do talk quite a bit about the, the like long chain hydrocarbons and things like that. And basically, um, RP1 has a lot of carbon molecules, like a ton of random carbon molecules linked into it. And uh, because of that, some of them will dislodge and become um, soot deposits and even like almost like little like soot stalactites and everything. As a matter of fact, I learned this from Peter Beck when, when I was... When I was sitting on the launch pad with Peter Beck, I asked him about all the sparking of the upper stage because the upper stage you'll notice has these sparks flying out of it. It looks almost like it might be like an ablative nozzle ablating some material. Nope, that's not what it is. It is literally bits of carbon breaking off of the face of the injector that are temporarily kind of sticking in there like little stalactites shooting off and, and then because they're like on fire, they're just like really bright little sparks. So um, methylox does not have that. Methylox is just um, CH4. So it's uh, it's basically only I don't remember how exactly it works, but um, I talk about it here quite a bit. Let's let's go here. We can go rocket pollution. Let's just look this up, and you guys, I'll, I'll show you exactly how much do rockets pollute, and we can see um, exactly all of the stuff. So, um, ba, 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 ba. um, yeah, I get really nerdy on this stuff. So, oh, that's a, that's a cute little graphic. I really liked making this video and it didn't do so well, but, um, I'm, I don't know what I'm looking for here. Anyway, basically there's just not as many carbon molecules, uh, in, in methane as there are in RP1. So therefore there's, n there's not as many that just get ejected from, uh, in the burning process that end up just like having a place to randomly stick around. So, um, that's the main reason it just, it literally burns cleaner. So there's, yeah, there you go. Um, from Anoush, how are you? Um, Anoush Patel says, have a coffee on me. Thank you. I'm going to definitely, I'm already tired. This is definitely going to be a problem. I'm already tired. I'm already like ready for bed. And this is just one of two. So I'm definitely gonna have to take a, a massive power nap <laughs> as soon as this launch is over. So hopefully it goes off relatively on time. David, thank you so much. And an even better pair, riding a firework rocket disappearing away before bursting in the sky. <laughs> thank you, David. That's really nice. Everyone say a real quick uh, thank you to David. That is really unbelievably generous. Thank you so much, David, seriously. Um, we have a great question here from, um, S Santhosh T Kumar. What is cost per launch? It's, it's around five or 6 million. We don't know exactly. It's not something that's necessarily published, but it, you could probably buy a rocket from rocket lab for about $6 million, um, which is definitely a goal of mine. I want to have a rocket lab rocket literally just sitting in my like living room someday. That is total life goal, <laughs> total, total life goal. Okay. Um, let's see. So this is a, this is an interesting question. Spe or interesting statement from Speedy Cunahan. They will never beat SpaceX. Well, you know what? That's not a good attitude, my friend. <laughs> Think about it. That's like saying um, Ford will never beat Chevy or Ferrari will never beat McLaren or whatever. Blah. It doesn't mean there's not room for both of them. And maybe someday, you know, there's there's different. Uh, first off, I'm totally hashtag team space, like a hundred percent team space. I really think that we do better when everyone's working and not necessarily together. I think, I think the, the competition aspect is great, but I think it's really silly to just, just be tribalistic and think there's one, there's one thing that you like and everything else sucks. And in my opinion, Rocket Lab is actually one of the most innovative companies that I've ever seen come out because one of the, they do three things that are super unique to an orbital class rocket. Number one, they use an entirely carbon composite fuselage and tank. There's no liner in the tank. It's entirely made out of carbon composites, uh, carbon fiber, and that, that's just amazing. They use 3D printed rocket engines, and these rocket engines are only about this big. So you can literally print them in like this, like refrigerator sized, you know, 3D printing machine, and they can have just a bunch of those machines just printing out engines all day long pretty much, which is really cool. 
and they use electric pumps. So instead of uh, using a gas generator or um, a pre-burner to be able to spin a turbine and then that turbine spins the pumps that suck all the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber, instead they literally just stick an electric motor on a pump and that pulls the, you know, the, the amount of pressure inside the tanks is about three bar and it then can force it into the combustion chamber at much higher pressures using electric energy. And those three technologies I think are super cool. It's really impressive that they develop those on, on such a small scale. But what's important, and again, watch the most two recent video, uh, two recent interviews I have with Peter Beck, their CEO, um, because this guy is just, he is honestly one of my favorite people to talk to. He's just an awesome guy, super smart, and thinking outside of the box a lot. And one of the things they're working on is a lot of off the part shelves. So when some when a satellite company makes a satellite, they start from, like they, they build something from scratch. It's like, why are they continually not reinventing, but having to just invent the wheel every single mission? There's very few, like there's literally like no parts catalog. You can't just be like, hey, uh, I'm just gonna go to bestbuy.com and purchase myself a gyroscope, you know, or whatever. Like there's no parts catalog for satellites and stuff. So what Rocket Labs, one of the things they're working on is having a parts catalog for satellites and creating a satellite bus called Photon, which will be a satellite, because it's really funny, the upper stage, that kick stage, takes the, the payload up to space and it has avionics, it has RCS thrusters, it has communications, it has solar panels, it has all of the things a satellite needs. And then once it gets to a destination, it just detaches from the satellite. So now the satellite has to have all those same things again. And honestly, it, like the more I learn about their thought process about trying to mass produce some of these smaller scale items it's like oh why hasn't this been done before so i really like what rocket lab is working on like the small end of things while spacex is working on getting humans to mars there's room for both there's room for a lot more than both of those two by the way there's a room for literally dozens and dozens of of, of launchers i think that all kind of you know take on some kind of unique market so um, in my opinion, they don't need to beat SpaceX, and they might never, ever, ever come anywhere close to like the amount of launches and the amount of revenue through that SpaceX outputs, but they don't need to. They absolutely do not need to. They can be more of a, bes of a bespoke little you know, rocket company that, that launches, um, yeah, launches less frequently and everything. I, I don't know. I don't know. That's just my opinion, but I, I, I tend to think that's kind of a, a good mentality, so... Uh, let's see here from Corey Black. Um, love the name of the rocket. Good day from South Australia. Huge fan of the channel. Looking forward to SpaceX's launch in a few hours too. Don't remind me. Thank you very much for your streams and videos. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Corey. That is, that is very nice of you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. Okay. This is, this is a, a good question here. This is from Campbell uh, Kilgore. Uh, do you know what the extra challenges are for launching in New Zealand when compared to closer to the equator? Well, New Zealand actually is almost the exact same latitude. Uh, their launch site's almost the same latitude as their launch site in Virginia. So um, obviously a lower, you know, a closer to the equator would be beneficial, but there's only one launch site that's anywhere near the equator, and that's uh, the French Guiana, that, and that's where the Ariane 5 launches from. That's like literally the only one on the equator the rest of like the United States, the lowest, in, the lowest inclination is 28 or the lowest latitude is 28 degrees. Um, I think these are more like 38, if I remember right, or 35, somewhere around there. It wallops and LC1 and LC2 are both on that same. It just means that you have a little bit more limited minimum inclination. Now, I know that sounds really confusing and maybe I should get out my globe for you guys. Uh, everyone say globe, just type globe if you want me to get the globe and explain it using a globe because we can go two ways of this thing. If I see if I see more globes than no, okay, I'm seeing globes already. Okay, I will be right back. <laughs> okay, we're gonna talk inclinations, I'll be right back. Okay. Did you miss me? I hope I hope you all survived my absence. It was a very long time. Oh yeah, I could have grabbed one of those <laughs> one of the Mova globes directly behind me. I am an idiot. The spinning globes directly over my shoulder. Okay, so this is this is a thing called the globe. That's a representation of Earth. 
And obviously, you guys know you live somewhere on this. Unless you're one of the five astronauts currently aboard the International Space Station, then hi. Thanks for watching. Otherwise, uh, the rest of you guys all watching are somewhere on a thing about like this in a vast thing of almost nothingness. And here's the deal. If see this bar right here, pretend this bar was a loop. That would be a zero degree inclination. That means that you would be launching over the poles and your, your payload would go up and down over the poles. If you were to watch, launch from the equator here, um, and which again, French Guiana is pretty much <laughs> right here on the equator around here somewhere. Uh, if you launch due east at a, on the equator, that is zero degrees latitude. That means you can launch at a zero degree inclination. Anywhere else from there, every orbit will pass through the equator twice. So, or, or infinite times. If you're like directly on the equator, you'll infinitely be on the equator. But anywhere else, like anywhere north or south from that, you'll always be going through the equator. So let's say you launch from Florida here. This is, of course, Launch Complex 39A here, uh, 28 degrees uh, north. What's going to happen, even if you go straight east launching, you'll end up the you'll end up getting like pulled down towards the equator. And then it'll go down here to 28 degrees south. And then it'll bounce back up and wrap around and go back up to 28. And you still always pass over 28 degrees north and south. Um, New Zealand's basically the same thing. New Zealand, like I said, I think is about 38. So it's down here. Um, yeah, that seems about right, actually. It must be about 38. Um, yeah, you launch from there, and you're going to end up, even if you launch due east, you're going to end up going over the equator. And then you'll go up to 38 north, and then you'll fall back down to 38. So you'll pass over the equator twice, every orbit. If you need, this stuff can be really confusing. And this is one of those, another video that I learned a lot about. I have a video called, uh, Why Do Cylindrical Rockets Roll? And it's not about like going, you know, rolling, like, uh, pitching over. It's about like, why does a rocket that's like a stick, why does it spin? You know, why does a rocket like this spin? Why can't it just go like, yeah, point wherever it needs to go? If it's cylindrical, why does it need to? So I have a video all about that. I talk about launch inclinations versus the um, latitude and all that stuff. And it's I, I think that's one of those fun little videos. So yeah, um, <laughs> sorry for the random rant, but it's really not any harder. Um, it's just more limited on your exact inclinations that you can end up launching, but it's very, very normal. Yeah. Um, Let's see here. Uh, when is my next interview with a Rocket CEO? Well, I'm definitely working on uh, an interview with Tori Bruno. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to Tori because I, I well, I want to talk to him about Vulcan because Vulcan's obviously really close to coming online. They'll and it'll be his company's ULA United Launch Alliance will be launching humans. Hopefully, you know, probably next year sometime, assuming Starliner goes okay um, with their next test flight. But the thing that I'm really excited to talk to Tori is about, is about aerospikes. You guys know, I kind of had this love for the aerospike rocket engine and he worked on, uh, on the X 33 program and for venture star. And whew, I, there's so many questions that I have. I really want to get good insight from him on that. And Tori's just an awesome guy. If you guys don't follow Tori, he's definitely one of the, uh, cooler CEOs, you know, rocket CEOs to be talking to. Okay, the live stream just went live for Rocket Lab, so let me get that kind of pulled up here. I don't hear any sound from it currently, but hopefully it's about to come through. And as soon as it does, I will let you guys know here. Actually, we can do this. We can go, uh, we can go like these and pull them up. Look at that. I'm doing. I didn't bork it <laughs> for about the first time in my life. Yay. Um, so hopefully, uh, I think the next one would be Tori Bruno. I think we're going to have another conversation with Elon Musk here soon again um, at Boca Chica, doing a little like tour of Boca Chica. I think that's something that's going to be happening sometime this year. So I don't know if that'll happen next. I also want to be talking to Tim Ellis from Relativity Space. Um, I've definitely got a lot on my plate and I'm really excited for some of these things in the future. So stay tuned. We got good stuff coming. I promise. Um, what's my favorite space movie from Eric Hanna? Sorry, that didn't pop up on the screen. I'm not sure what happened. Maybe I need to refresh this year. Um, Eric Hanna says, what's my favorite movie? Oh, oh, I am very behind already. Oh, I know why it's not on there. Hang on. <laughs> but what if I go like this? Now is it going to show up? Anyway, sorry, Eric. My favorite space movie is either The Martian or Apollo 13. Um, definitely. Let's see here. Um, um, 
I don't know what this is in reference to. Um, Andrew Hayes says, um, oh, here we go. Andrew Hayes says, why 58 only? I don't quite, does anyone know what that, anyone know what that is? What's, what's, what's 58? Why 58 only? I don't know what that is. I don't know what we're talking about here. Um, this clock is probably wrong, by the way. Um, I'll keep trying to go here. Um, this is from Deku. Hey, Tim, I'm fascinated by your rockets in the back. Yeah, I've got some cool rockets. Those are from Ollie Braun. Um, he makes some of the best rockets, and uh, you can't have them. Actually, you probably you can't have them. Yeah, you can have them. I just uh, You can't have mine because... Um, oh, what's with 58? Well, hey, Andrew, you're going to have to tune in. I, I see what you're saying. What's with 58 f for Starlink? You'll have to tune in tonight, and I'll tell you all about it. Or just go to pre-launch previews, and you can figure it out yourself. <laughs> Spoiler. Electron mission, don't stop me now. I'm Max Muncy, and I'm coming to you live from Rocket Lab Mission Control. Thanks for joining us as we get ready to go to space once again. Earlier in the week, we stood down from a launch attempt for this mission due to high ground winds at Launch Complex 1. When it comes to launch, there are thousands of things within our control, but the weather simply is not one of them. We're back in the pad today, but we're still keeping an eye on weather conditions and are currently green for launch at T0. Earlier this week, it was high ground winds that caused us to stand down, and today we're tracking heavy cloud this time. At this stage, it's likely, likely we could go into a planned hold at T-12 minutes to wait for a gap in the weather for launch. Today's mission is a rideshare launch to low Earth orbit for NASA, the National Reconnaissance Office, and the University of New South Wales Canberra Space. One of the satellites on board today is the NASA Andesite Satellite. This payload has been created by students and professors at Boston University to study the Earth's magnetic field as part of NASA's CubeSat, CubeSat launch initiative. There are also three payloads on board which are designed, built, and operated by the NRO. This mission was procured under the agency's rapid acquisition of a small rocket or Razor contract vehicle, which allows the NRO to explore new launch opportunities that provide a streamlined, commercial approach for getting small satellites into space. This mission follows Rocket Lab's first dedicated mission for the NRO, which was Birds of a Feather, and that was launched in January this year. The final small sat on board Electron is the M2 Pathfinder satellite, a collaboration between the University of New South Wales Canberra Space and the Australian government to test communications architecture and other technologies. We'd like to thank our mission partners for choosing Electron as their ride to space today. It's great to be able to meet the needs of a diverse payload class, from national security to, to research projects on the same mission. Now, as usual, we will we'll be ending the live broadcast shortly after kick stage separation, so we won't be bringing you live video of payload deployment. Keep an eye on our social media pages for updates regarding deployment after the webcast has concluded. Yay. Hey, thanks to Brian and Tom. Um, yeah, and, and Calf and all those that um, I just, let's see here. <laughs> um, so this is, again, how, how SpaceX fixed satellites in a Falcon fairing. Uh, yeah, again, we will definitely need to be talking about that in the SpaceX stream here that's going to be in just about three or four hours. But I, I need to definitely take this moment here to talk about the fact that, remember, this rocket is black. This is a black rocket. What you're seeing, why you see a bunch of white and, and almost a majority Today's of white. Today's launch is taking place in Rocket Lab Launch Complex 1 on New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula, the world's only private orbital launch facility. From our inception, the mission has been to open access to space for small satellites, and key to that access is launch frequency. We designed and built a launch site that can support up to 120 missions per year to offer our customers unprecedented access to space. Today, Electron is standing tall on LC-1 Pad A, but just out of the frame, work is continuing on Pad B, an additional launch pad within the same complex. By operating two pads at the same site, we eliminate the time required between launches for a full pad recycle, and instead we can launch back-to-back -back within hours, not days, weeks, or months. That's awesome. We've made something of a habit of building launch sites here at Rocket Lab, and the pads at Launch Complex 1 only comprise two of the three pads that we operate. Right now, we're preparing for our first mission from another pad, Rocket Lab Launch Complex 2. This pad is located at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport within the NASA WALPS Flight Facility in Virginia, USA. We are just weeks away from our first launch from this site, a dedicated mission in partnership with the Department of Defense's Space Test Program and the Space and Missile Systems Center's Small Launch and Targets Division. Our team recently conducted the vehicle rollout and integrated systems tests to verify launch systems on Electron and the ground systems ahead of this exciting first mission. Let's check out some of the action going down at Launch Complex 2. 
Okay, so while, we, while they roll this beautiful footage here, um, we will answer a few more questions here. Okay, so um, this is from James, or Jesse, sorry, from Jesse Connell. Uh, did I see Scott Manley's video about uh, the fairing video? Do the fairings have pistons to push payloads apart versus pyro, as he mentioned, or are the pistons for pushing apart fairings? Video uh, is amazing, just curious. So Rocket Lab does also use... Um, non-pyrotechnic devices as separators for their fairings and, and payload separation and things like that. They do not use pyrotechnics. That's also a good thing for being good stewards of space because that way they don't accidentally, you know, have explosive bolts putting things into orbit, um, little extra debris that's unnecessary. Hey, by the way, I was, this is the launch pad that I was sitting at for an interview. So if you guys uh, with Peter Beck, so if you guys need to learn more about Rocket Lab and just hear from their awesome CEO, Peter Beck, Please give that a watch. I promise it's worth your time. He is so cool. And uh, I really, really like hearing from him. So we sat right there where the rocket is, and it was awesome. Legs dangling in the flame trench even. Right right there. Good thing our legs weren't there when they were lighting the engines. Um, oops. Stay tuned for updates about our first mission from LC2 in the coming weeks. But for now, let's head back to LC1 as we hit T minus 7 minutes and 30 seconds until launch for today's Don't Stop Me Now mission. So as I was mentioning, though, FTS you'll notice and enabled for flight. that the FTS rocket is, and is basically primarily is more white than it is black, even though it's made out of black carbon fiber. And again, that is actually a sheet of ice. So the reason that the certain segments are, are completely white right now and covered in ice is because that is where the liquid oxygen is. And of course, liquid oxygen goes from a gas to a liquid at minus 183 degrees Celsius. So it's unbelievably cold. If you went up and touched that right now, your hand would stick to it. You would It would freeze off. It would not be a very good thing. Uh, and... You, so you're seeing that, you know, you're seeing uh, what looks like smoke pour out, but that's just actually condensation. So this is kind of like, you know, dry ice. When you see dry ice sitting out, how it has like smoke coming off it. That's just um, condensate. That's just water in the air, water molecules in the air, condensing it and becoming um, becoming little droplets of ice and making these like four clouds of converse, condensation. So that's all you're seeing here. Good fueled launch vehicle designed specifically for small satellite missions. Today, Electron has flown 48 commercial and government small satellites to space. Successful, successful deployment of today's payload will bring that total count to 53. The satellites on board this rideshare mission are safely encapsulated inside the rocket's nose cone structure, which you, which you can see on the top of the vehicle, and that's otherwise called the fairing. As we make our way down Electron, you can see white stripes have formed around the vehicle's black structure. This effect is created by the cold liquid oxygen in Electron's tanks, which causes moisture to condense as ice on the outside of the rocket. The first stage, the area where you see the largest white band, is essentially one large fuel tank for the nine 3D printed Rutherford engines at the bottom of the vehicle that will propel Electron through Earth's atmosphere on its way to space. Now, when it comes to launch frequency, we've implemented numerous techniques like 3D printing and automated manufacturing to help us build and launch vehicles faster and more often. But, if, but what if we could avoid the need to build a whole new stage every flight? This is exactly what our team is working on right now. We are well into our development program to make Electron a reusable launch vehicle, a process that will involve retrieving Electron from the sky with a helicopter after it has descended back through the Earth's atmosphere under a parachute. While we're not conducting any recovery testing on today's mission, you can keep an eye out for recovery developments on our 17th Electron mission coming up later this year. In the past three years, Electron has become well acquainted with low Earth orbit, but in the coming months, we'll be venturing a little further, some 384,000 kilometers further. Early mm -hmm. next year, Rocket Lab will launch a CubeSat into lunar orbit for, for NASA. This historic pathfinding mission supports NASA's Artemis program, which will land the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024. Using our Electron rocket and Photon lunar spacecraft, Rocket Lab will launch NASA's Capstone CubeSat into a unique lunar orbit. Capstone stands for Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment. Capstone's primary objective is to test and verify the calculated orbital stability of the near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon, which is the same orbit plan for the lunar gateway. The gateway is a planned small space station that will orbit around the moon to provide astronauts access to the lunar surface. It will feature living quarters for astronauts, a lab for science and research, and ports for visiting spacecraft. Capstone will also test a navigation system that will measure its position relative to NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, without relying on ground stations. Capstone is one of the first steps to learn how to operate more robust missions in this orbit, and it's laying the groundwork for future exploration of our solar system. We are incredibly excited to be part of this historic mission, and we can't wait to share it with you. 
So as we continue through today's count, let me hand you over to the team in Mission Control to listen in on the final minutes before liftoff. That's awesome. There's Peter back up there in the top row, the one uh, kind of almost all the way. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but it's uh, he's in the uh, almost the last one before the glass top, like all the way in the top right, but uh, one over. <laughs> That's like the, the third one from the left, second one from the right. I don't know. I'm doing an awful, awful job of describing where Peter Beck is in the in the annual game of Tim describes where Peter Beck is in the live stream. Okay, so this is from Scott six twenty or sixty seven twenty five. It's Scott's birthday. Hope we light this candle. That would be an awesome birthday candle. Everyone in chat, give Scott a quick birth happy birthday wish. Uh, what an awesome candle to have lit on your birthday. Super cool. Happy birthday, Scott. All right, so uh, Michael. Um, Let's see. The, it could be a twilight phenomenon launch, Michael, asking about whether or not the sun will backlight the plume um, on this upcoming Starlink launch. So we'll have to see in about four hours, uh, four or five hours, and it's going to be awesome. I, I, I think it should. Right near the like second stage burn, it will probably be very well illuminated by then. Um, yeah. Ooh, look at that pretty sunset. That is cool. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'm trying to keep up with you guys here. A new membership here too. Thank you so much. Um, I answered this question the other night too. Um, I think this is a fun question. Right now, if I could fly in anything, it would probably be, well, in in a couple years after Crew Dragon's flown probably 20 times, I would consider flying tr Crew Dragon. Uh, I'm just a wuss. But I think Blue Origin's new Shepard looks really safe, and you're only gone for like. 20 minutes you know like i don't want to be up in space for weeks or months i, I just want to do a quick little like i think my maximum stay would be like three or four days would be plenty of time in space PLS okay let's show. listen in here to turn let PLS, copies PLS, please begin re uh lots good research copy beginning research uh lassie uh go to everydayastronaut.com slash pre-launch previews click on today's mission um we don't really know a lot about these necessarily the payloads there's a lot of them on there though there's five different satellites so um yeah um different different random things little experiments and things like that so yeah pls flight on mission pls copies please disable anti-geysering and confirm anti-geysering disabled stage one confirm stage one tanks pressed Stage 1 is pressed. Stage 2 confirmed. Stage 2 tanks pressed. Stage 2 is pressed. Sweet. Yes. Let's do this. Ooh, yeah, good call. Uh, we do need, uh, really quick, my rocket Data orientation. Active. They're probably waiting on that. Uh, the other's running. The pointy end is up, and the flamey end is down. <sighs> Don't worry, guys. I know, you were worried. So was Rocket Lab. I'm sure they were sweating over there. It is confirmed. It is confirmed. Pointy end is up, flaming end is down. You're welcome. Rocket orientation skills. <laughs> that was close. That was way too close. Okay, here we go. I think they're going to do this. Yes. Okay, Eight, let's listen in. Nine, eight, seven, beautiful shot. six, five, four, three, two, one. Yes. Yes. Vehicles get back. It's cool. So you're seeing some of the ice Station falling off select. the side of the rocket. Well, after a brief hiatus, Electron is back in the skies, heading to orbit. At T plus 35 seconds into flight, we're coming up to one of the first milestones of any mission to space, passing max Q. This is the point at which Electron will experience the highest amount of aerodynamic force on its way to orbit. Let's listen into the call from Mission Control. Flying through a lot of clouds today, huh? So 
is already 10 kilometers, 6 miles in altitude that quickly. Coming up on maximum dynamic pressure. Pass through max Q. Stage 1 propulsion is holding nominal. Stand by and there you have it, Electron has cleared seconds. max Q. Super overexposed. Come on, baby. Entering burnout to tech mode. AOS Chatham Station. Coming up next is main engine cutoff or MECO, which occurs when the nine Rutherford engines shut down after exhausting their fuel reserves. Upon shutdown, the empty stage is jettisoned so that stage two can, ign can ignite and continue on its journey to low Earth orbit. That's awesome. I love the shot. Seconds remaining. On the right there, you're seeing the inner stage. So you're, at the very top, you're seeing the, the bell nozzle of the second stage engine and all those different COPVs and different bottles for the hydraulics and things like that kind of all pressed up in there. And on the left, you're seeing the engine plume expanding because now it's getting into thinner and thinner air. I mean, it's already 60 kilometers in altitude. You know, that's pretty high up there. That's 40 some miles, basically. And... Uh, yeah, it's it's just getting wider and wider and wider because there's less and less and less air to, to constrict the flow of the engines. Miko confirmed. Sweet. Main engine cutoff confirmed. Stage two ignition confirmed. Woo! Uh, the, the feed in the audio is a little bit off here. No big deal. Makes sense that we see telemetry downloading. That's the call we're looking video. for. We've had successful Miko, clean separation of Electron's first stage, and ignition of the vacuum optimized Rutherford engine on Electron's second stage. We're approaching T plus three minutes into this mission with fairing separation coming fairing up. Fairing separation complete. It's looking good. There goes the fairings. That's awesome. And there it is on your screen. The fairing has separated, clearing the way for payload deployment, which occurs approximately one hour Station after liftoff. Station is nominal. Yeah, they honestly, Rocket Lab is some of the best. So the next few minutes, you'll be hearing feeds. the word nominal quite a bit. The latest call was from Kevin Garcia, our stage two operator. It's one of our favorite words at Rocket Lab, and it simply means everything is going as expected throughout the flight. I love this little rocket. It's so cool. On your left, you'll see a view of the operators in the mission control room. These are the people you've been listening to throughout the broadcast on the mission control net, and they're monitoring all things launch related from propulsion and telemetry data all the way through to our network traffic. We've heard plenty of updates from George Buchanan, our GNC operator today. The Rocket Lab GNC team are actively recruiting for senior roles in our Photon satellite program. So if you have a solid background in mathematics or physics, head to our careers section at rocketlabusa.com for more info. That's awesome. 250 seconds remaining. 250 seconds, so what is that? Four minutes, basically. So notice, the, the big thing here, kind of right... Stage two proportion me, remains nominal. Um, that is one of, the ba uh, one of the batteries, and there's basically three of them attached to the electron. Three or, I think, four, three or four, but there's a pair of them that are going to eject here because they kind of treat it like a fuel, where normally that's one of the disadvantages of, of batteries is that you carry the weight of the batteries into orbit. That's one of the things that'll, that Rocket Lab figured out, though. Up next is the battery hot swap. This step is unique to electron and its battery-powered pumps housed within the Rutherford engines. The pair of batteries that carried us thus far are nearing depletion, so to finish the job, we swap power over to a third fully charged battery. Let's wait for confirmation from Mission Control. And what's cool is they're placed on opposite sides of the stages, so when they both, you know, eject, they cancel, they null each other's, like, momentum out, right? Because otherwise, if just one ejected, it'd kind of knock the stage in the other way. So I think that's a really cool solution that they just have both of them eject, a really elegant and simple solution here. So we'll see those eject here relatively soon. And remember what I said earlier about the little sparks. Those are not sparks. Those are actually bits of carbon um, ejecting out of the nozzle. 
But they're little bits of carbon that, that build up on the injector phase for just a second because of the RP1. And uh, then they break off, and because it's carbon and it's really hot. battery discharge nominal. Approach your hot spot. That's okay. fucking down. Get ready here. And you can tell that the you can tell Plus the nozzle. The nozzle is very good. There we go. That's so cool. Battery jettison confirmed. That is so cool. And those wind up burning back, burning As up on the battery. As you've just we've had successful battery hot swap. Electro electron's trajectory continues to look nominal as we hit 6 minutes and 50 seconds into this mission. And you'll notice that the nozzle, it, you know, people might think it's ablative when they see all those sparks and stuff. Definitely not ablative, that's why it's glowing it's red. Holding nominal. It is radiating heat away. It's a niobium nozzle extension just like the Merlin vacuum engine. It's really cool. If you're just joining us, we've had successful liftoff of Rocket Lab's Don't Stop Me Now mission aboard our Electron launch vehicle. We are nearing second engine cutoff with kick stage separation scheduled in about a minute and a half. While on this mission, the kick stage is being used in its most basic form to deploy our customer payloads to orbit. However, the kick stage can be adapted to become a satellite in its own right. With the addition of elements like higher performance propulsion, radiation tolerant components, and solar panels, the kick stage becomes Photon, Rocket Lab's in-house designed, built, and operated satellite. Keep an eye out for our first photon GD mission coming soon. Let's see. I'm going to take a few more questions here so I can get to please. The next major milestone you'll hear is SECO or second engine cutoff. This marks the end of the second stage burn, after which, after which the kick stage will separate in preparation for payload deployment. I have I have to go to bed and get a little nap in before the what SpaceX launch. But Sam, uh, we've not heard any have to take ever that? for an actual uh, a secondary rocket lab or an upgrade beyond the block upgrade to be able to do recovery with Electron. They seem to have plenty of customers flying Electron, so I don't think they have any need or desire for anything else. So. Um, at least for now, maybe in, you know, five years, things might change, but, um, yeah. Let's see. And thank you for amazing kind of, it would be a huge honor if you could congratulate your partner, Eton, on his grad school graduation. Everyone say congrats to Eton. That is super cool. On Oh, here we go. Perfect timing. We can celebrate together. We can celebrate Seiko and Eton's. Uh, graduation. Congrats, that was awesome. And thank you for saying hi. Let's see. And there you have it. The kick stage is on its way to deliver the payloads to their individual orbits. For those of you who might be wondering what the kick stage is, here's a quick explanation of how this ingenious machine works to deploy payloads to orbit. Once the second stage take us, takes us to an elliptical parking orbit, the kick stage separates and ignites its 3D printed Curie engine, circularizing the orbit. Using a cold gas reaction control system, the kick stage accurately orients itself to deploy each satellite to a specific orbit. Using this system, the kick stage is able to insert its payloads with precise orbits, even on rideshare missions with multiple satellites like this one. After deployment, the Curie engine reignites, propelling the kick stage to a lower orbit where it will be dragged into the Earth's atmosphere at a much faster rate, leaving behind nothing in orbit but our customer satellites. Payload deployment is expected in the next hour or so, and we'll share confirmation on our Rocket Lab Twitter and Facebook accounts when we can. A final thank you to all the small satellite operators on board this 12th Electron mission for choosing Rocket Lab as your mission partner. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and we'll see you again here soon. I'm Max Muncy, and until next time, this is Rocket Lab Mission Control signing off. Awesome. Huge congrats, Rocket Lab. You guys just make this stuff look so easy already. I don't know how you do it. Everyone, quick little round of applause for Rocket Lab for a gorgeous launch. Beautiful, flawless execution so far. Assuming they'll have no problems with payload deployment and all that stuff. So awesome, awesome work. I'm going to fire through your guys' questions so I can try to get some sleep before the SpaceX mission that's in, what, three and a half hours or something already. So um, let, me, let me get to some of these real quick here. Robin, um, they will start using helicopters on Flight 17. This was Flight 12. So... Fingers crossed everything goes well before then. So um, thanks for saying hi. 
Um, I could also buy an Electra and a pair of Falcon 9 fairings. I think that's a great idea. Thank you so much. Happy hacking video blog. Um, how do the residents, uh, how do resident ISS crew vote? Do they send absentee ballots on Crew Dragon? You know, I think there is a way. I think they send in absentee ballots, but I think they even do it maybe potentially before they're on station. I don't remember, but I think I've heard the answer before. Discord, if you guys know the answer, the actual answer, and not just what I think I might remember, let me know. Um, let's see. If a crewed rocket launches from the southern hemisphere, do the space toilets continue to flush in counterclockwise direction? Now that's a good question. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, from Empirical, I think calling it Don't Stop Me Out jinxed it. Hey, but they did it today, so don't worry. Um, let's see here. From, from John, uh, Jonathan, how will SpaceX forge the massive titanium grid fins for super heavy as, as SpaceX already broke a world record for grid fins on Falcon 9? No idea. Maybe they can forge it in sections and then like weld or something extra segments together. So I have no idea. Maybe bolt parts of it together. I genuinely have no idea how they're going to manage the grid fins that are going to be like four times bigger on super heavy than they are on Falcon 9. Who honestly knows? <laughs> Dang, from unhinged, deranged, bro from Canada. So I bet this tops out at like $35 or some garbage. But hey, it's enough to have a few drinks and be while watching launch. And shout out during launch. Thank you so much, unhinged, deranged. Everyone say thank you. That is really generous. Even in Can Canadian, Candananian dollars. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> it's awesome. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Caesar, what material are the, the 3D printed engines out of? Thanks for the informative streams. We talked about this last time. What was it again? Was it? Ah, crap. Oh, there's an electronic ballot that they vote through, according to Discord. Thank you, guys. Um, like, via email. But the engines are made... I'm pretty sure the engines are pr 3D printed with, like, Inconel or something really, 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 really strong. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Corey Black, off the part shelves. Hey, you know, I mean, at one point there weren't off the part shelves at all before. Um, yeah, uh, for, for cars, and now there are. You know, they're, they're working on kind of an off the shelf solution. So, yeah. And Howard, uh, what would you think about a company that produced a uh, ready made bi propellant rocket engine? I have a one kilonewton 3D printed rocket engine that you're working on. Um, I think that's a pretty cool idea, Howard. I mean, I, I think if you have a market for it and can produce it at a cost and, you know, do the research and development and, and the manufacturing of it cheaper than another company can do in-house, in of course, there'd be a market for that, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Guys, I, I know I need to go to bed, but I need to answer a few more of these. Um, could a Rutherford-style electric pump engine be used for a second stage on top of a more common first stage? Any major disadvantages? Hi from Australia. Thank you so much. Um, so, of course, you could you could mix and match. You could have a normal turbo pump fed first stage and electric second stage. The major disadvantage is really it's in weight. And that's the fact that lithium ion batteries or lithium polymer batteries, any battery is going to be several an order of magnitude or more like less efficient than just the chemical energy in the rocket propellant. So even though they're good at storing energy, um, you end up carrying a lot more weight to be able to spin the pumps. So it just takes, you know, because that those pumps get, you know, spun by something, something has to power those pumps. And, you know, I think Elon even said like the pumps that power Raptor uh, are about 10,000 horsepower or 100,000 horsepower, something insane. So think about how big of a battery it would take to be able to sustain that for an entire rocket launch, right? It, the battery would be like bigger than the entire, like super heavy. Um, so the, <laughs> that might be an exaggeration. I have no idea, but um, you know, that, that, that's definitely the disadvantage. It's just simply the, the energy density of batteries versus chemical, chemical energy. But that's one of the cool things. Again, Electron ditches two of the three batteries on ascent. Once they're like depleted, they just ditch them. And that way it frees up some of that dead weight. So they kind of make a nice little, yeah. Um, pretty, pretty cool. Thank you so much from, um, Alexis Rojas. Thank you very much. You're awesome. Um, 
Um, Brazil's working on a launch site at 22 degrees south, and also near my town, 35 degrees south, there will be a small rocket launch site called uh, Barrera de Inferno, Hell's Bearer. That's super awesome. Matthias, thank you so much for... Yeah, I, I knew about the one in, in, in Brazil, but I did not know about the other one. Um, I'll say really quickly that... Uh, why can't I click on this one? Hang on. I'm having a problem with my thing here real quick. Um, I, I really quickly just have to say that I, I love Copenhagen Suborbitals. They are awesome. And yes, I'm fully aware they use my music. That is, of course, with permission because they are awesome. And I visited them in 2015. Uh, really cool people. I'll be doing a video about them when I visit them again here soon. Um, Um, so if, if basically if SpaceX is subsidized in shell companies, how can we claim that it's private space exploration? Well, it's not directly government funded. That's, that's the whole thing. Yes, there's government contracts, but, um, that's the whole difference is that it's not like a government owned entity. It's a private company. So whether or not it's private through other investors and stuff, it, uh, just like rocket lab, it's, there's lots of investors, but Yeah. Let's see here. I'm trying to get caught up here. Where are we at? Um, um, so Chris, who do you have more faith in SLS or Starship? I have a 50 minute video talking all about that. And that's one of like three, because this is a long, it was originally going to be a 75 minute video, but I ended up cutting it up into just one for now, salvaging what I could get out of it and then changing up some of the things because of the human lander systems and things like that. But um, frankly, I mean, for the near term to be able to get humans to the moon, near term, definitely SLS and Orion because it's literally like the hardware is done. Um, certified, done. To be able to fly humans on Starship will be um, a little while longer still. I don't really know for sure, so yeah. Let's see, I'll, I'll try to, I think I missed a couple of you guys' questions, and I'm really trying to not skip over you guys, but I do have to try to get, um, let's see. Um, would it be interesting doing a video on robotics and space industry? Someday, definitely. I, I, I definitely want to do that. Um, <laughs> it's been a while since you watched. Well, thanks for joining, Michael. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see. Um, absolutely not. I'll never get back in the spacesuit. <laughs> no way. Stinky, sweaty, terrible, and I just think off brand at this point. Um, Luke again, gas money for coffee run. Wait, you have an <laughs> I have an electric car. It doesn't need gas, but thank you, Luke. That's awesome. Um, what is specific impulse and why is it measured in seconds? Watch my video about it was either the Raptor engine or the aerospike engine, but basically specific impulse is Imagine you have a rocket engine and you're trying to push one kilogram of payload or something. You're, tr you're trying to produce like one kilonewton of thrust there. We'll just say that. Um, how long with X amount of propellant can you push that same amount of force? So it, it's measured in seconds. Like how many seconds can you, can you use that same amount of fuel to push? So a really inefficient engine would suck up all that fuel in like, you know, we'll say... 100 seconds or whatever and a really efficient engine can use that same amount of fuel pushing that same amount for 300 seconds so it's a huge 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 um bonus there specific impulse is super cool this is definitely something i have to do josiah um, a video about different common orbits that is literally on the list so do not worry thank you so much um Alyssa pipe why don't we see more press on blue origin because they don't need it. <laughs> They're self-funded. They get like a billion dollars a year from Jeff Bezos and they already are winning tons of contracts. They pay their employees plenty well and go to job fairs and stuff and they just like being quiet. That's just kind of their thing. So yeah, um, good question though. They're, they're a really cool company. I think once they start flying, people will appreciate what they do a lot more. Um, C.E. Newton, thank you so much for saying hi and for the generous donation. Um, let's see, Rocky, uh, go... Uh, if it doesn't fit your face, go to shop at everyday or email shop at everydayastronaut.com and they'll take care of you. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Let's see here. Where can we get the model rockets? These are from Epic, uh, or wait, what? Epic Space? I'm, it's too late. I can't even remember. Uh, Ollie Braun, what? 
What is his site? Ollie Braun. Why? What am I? I'm losing my mind right now. Buzz Space Models. That was really embarrassing because I've worked with Ollie for so long. Buzzspacemodels.com. Um, yeah. Um, let's see here. Lucas, as mentioned in the stream, is not an ablative nozzle. It is radiating heat away using a niobium nozzle extension. It's made out of niobium. Super, super awesome. Um, Alexander, I still feel bad about them throwing away batteries. You shouldn't because every other rocket ever, 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 ever has batteries in them that get thrown away. And as a matter of fact, those batteries get discarded pretty near orbital velocity, so they pretty much entirely get burnt up and depleted by the time they, they don't even touch the ground. So, no problem. Um, seeing the heat on the nozzle is incre nozzle dancing is incredible. Watching the metal turning white was mesmerizing. It really is. It's crazy that, you know, niobium can get red hot like that, or white hot even, and not just end up melting. Super, super awesome. Thank you so much from Derek. And um, let's see here. Jeez, this is great. St uh, Stefan, thank you so much. Hi, Tim. Uh, this is <laughs> to help you get a ticket on Starship slash Super Heavy to get you to Mars. No, no, I don't want to go to Mars. Don't make me go to Mars. Don't I'll become a Patreon and help Tim Dodd go to Mars. Not, <laughs> not kidding, Tim. But if you really don't want to go, instead, I'll go. <laughs> I'll go instead for you. Love from Oz. Thank you so much, Stefan. I, those of you that know me, yeah, I, I don't have any desire to go to Mars. Um, but, uh, I, I do want to go to space someday. I've, I've got to the point where I'm like someday before I die, I would love to go to space, especially the moon or something. Everyone say thank you to Steph. And that was really generous. Uh, thank you so much. Let's see. Can we get a reentry drone ship video in the future? Uh, I live for your deep dives. Yeah, we can, we can, we can do that. I've kind of done a couple videos talking about reentry, uh, things like why does SpaceX, throw away some rockets and why do they land on land and stuff like that. But I need to remake some of those, but yeah, um, I will, I will get to that here at some point. So, um, yeah. Um, from Emod name pronounced Emod like email. Uh, it's your birthday too. One heck of a candle for being 26 old. That is awesome. Everyone say happy birthday also to Emod. That is awesome. Thank you for tuning in and happy birthday. And you're awesome. What a genuinely awesome birthday candle. Um, again, buzzspacemodels.com for these. They're they're expensive, but they're great. They're really, really way too detailed to just be sitting in the back of a, in a case like this because they're awesome. Um, I will only be covering SpaceX and Rocket Lab. And thank you, Garrett. Grant, um, why does it... Why does it start off in an elliptical orbit and then get into a circular orbit? Um, they'll, they'll do that on purpose so that the stages burn up. Uh, well, I mean, just like the, the space shuttle's external fuel tank. It was left intentionally just below orbit. Like, the space shuttle's external fuel tank made it to, like, I don't remember, like 30, uh, you know, we'll say 150 or 200 kilometers by 30 kilometers. So the, inter the external fuel tank would re-enter and burn up. Um, so it wouldn't create space debris. They do that same type of thing here at Rocket Lab, just being good stewards of space. Um, hey, Tim, did you go to school and learn some of what you know, or did you learn everything on your own? Hi, Incognito. Thank you. Um, I learned quite literally every single thing I learned about rocket science I've learned in the last four years, uh, four or five years on my own. And 2014 was the first time I went to rocket, to um, Kennedy Space Center. I didn't know a single thing about rockets. I could barely tell you the difference between a space shuttle and a Saturn V. Like I could probably name those, but that was literally it. Um, so everything I've learned has been in the past six years and it's just been an obsession. And I think all of us can operate that way. When you get really into something, you research and to start learning and don't want to stop learning. And now I don't want to stop learning. I want to teach other people why I'm so excited. So, um, yeah. Um, from James, cheers for the stream. Followed your videos for a while and watched your launch sitting on the roof of your U in New Zealand. Looking forward to tonight's stream. That is awesome. Thanks, James. That's really cool. Thanks for saying hi. And, and I'm jealous. I would love to be in New Zealand right now. And Lisa Stojanovsky, who works at Rocket Lab. Can I give a shout out to Rocket Lab interns? Hello, Rocket Lab interns. I am jealous. You guys work for easily one of the coolest companies in the world. Dang. <laughs> Tell Peter Beck hi. Tell Lisa hi. And, uh, and please, please, please keep up the hard work and help us just explore space, get humans further into space, doing awesome things. 
And uh, and thanks for thanks for choosing a career in the aerospace industry. That's super awesome, um, guys. That's gonna do it for me tonight. Because well, not tonight. That's gonna do it for me for now. Because I have to get my butt going uh, and get to bed. But uh, if you guys want to again join me in a couple hours here, in about three hours, I'll be going live again for Starlink. Um, but if you guys, let's see. Um, if you guys want to help me continue to do what I do, consider becoming a Patreon member. We can join our awesome Discord channel. Um, and yeah, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. That means the world to me. You can join our Discord. You can do all of the awesome things. So, um, <laughs> all right. Um, that's going to, yeah, that's going to do it for me, guys. I love you guys. Uh, have a great night. And we'll see some of you, hopefully most of you here in just a few more hours. So, all right. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space on other for everyday people and going to try to do a quick power nap. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.